To give you background on uh, the survey, uh, this is a conversation that started between FSEA and IFC about a year ago. Uh, we were wanting to in, uh, uncover exactly what we know about retirement funds and the application, for instance, of Regulation 28, as well as uh, FSEA's new guidance notice, one of 2019. So we're aware that since Regulation 28 was introduced in 2012, it has been a journey for funds to integrate the environmental, social and governance screening requirements into their investment policy statements and into their fund management systems. This has been a journey and a journey and a learning curve for many. As you know, there's also been uh, an increased uh, popularity of green or climate focused investment instruments. Things like green bonds have become very popular since then. And we've seen that grow to a significant global market with a number of green bond issuances happening in South Africa in the last couple of years, thanks to work by the Johannesburg Stock Exchange and their sustainability segment. So what are the opportunities for pension funds to be part of this green and climate finance uh, trend? IFC has undertaken research, which indicates that there's approximately $588 billion in investment needs in South Africa alone up to 2030. So this is by looking at things like South Africa's commitment to the Paris Agreement uh, and uh, nationally determined contributions. So how will South Africa reduce its greenhouse gas emissions? How will South Africa chart out a transition to a low carbon economy? In doing so, it's not just about costs and reducing emissions. There are actually significant investment opportunities. This is an area where IFC has been very active in the past decade, investing for its own account uh, in green finance and climate finance opportunities, but also helping others to do that. And linked to that is our advisory support that we provide to financial sector regulators, to financial institutions, to banking associations, to uh, industry associations uh, like Batseta in South Africa, uh, to build the capacity of the financial sector to take advantage of these opportunities. So in uh, January, we developed a survey with uh, FSCA to uh, uh, investigate to what extent Regulation 28 and the guidance notice are being implemented, and then also to see what the readiness is and the current practices of retirement funds to allocate capital to green and climate uh, categories. Now, many of you on the line today are people who responded to that survey. So we want to say a huge thank you to you. We had approximately 140 funds responding to the survey, representing roughly, actually at 74% uh, of the total assets under management and 28% of total retirement funds in the industry. So that was a re very significant and, re and representative sample. And of those respondents, almost 100 actually gave us data on green finance allocation. Uh, and now this is very, it's very important uh, to recognize because there are currently no specific classifications or definitions for what qualifies green uh, assets in the South African market. After we launched the survey in, in January, there was a shift uh, in the market, uh, there is a growing momentum towards sustainable finance in South Africa. And one of those signals was the release of National Treasury's technical paper on financing a sustainable economy. This was released in May as a draft, and it included, included a number of recommendations for the financial sector and covering not just banking, but all parts of the financial sector, how to stimulate better climate risk response, climate investment, and the integration of ESG. One of those recommendations is the development of a taxonomy for green and climate finance. And so this happened after we distributed the survey, but it was a very welcome initiative that if, uh, if it is launched in 2021, uh, which is what's expected, there will in fact be a nationally agreed taxonomy or, or a classification of what qualify as green and climate friendly uh, assets, projects, and sectors. But in lieu of that, uh, a lot of work was done by the asset managers uh, on behalf of retirement funds to collect this data. What it does give us is a very interesting picture, which, which we look forward to exploring today. I'd like to start by just saying a few acknowledgements. Thank you to FSCA for their leadership and ongoing guidance in this important collaboration. 
As far as we know, this hasn't been done in any other emerging market. And there is some, there is some interest in replicating it in other countries. South Africa's pension fund sector, retirement fund sector is quite significant compared to other emerging markets. And they are looking to see what South Africa is doing um, as a trendsetter. Then special thanks to the retirement funds, asset consultants and asset managers whose contributions made this report possible. We could not have done without you. You gave us substantial data that is incredibly valuable and will be used to inform very important work uh, over the coming years. Then thank you to uh, IFC's donor partners who enable us to do this kind of technical work and advisory support, the Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, and the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, CEDA, for their partnership to the IFC Green Bond Market Development Program. And then appreciation to IntelliDex for the analysis and report pre preparation. So we will be hearing from IntelliDex. They will give uh, later in today's agenda. They will also give us uh, some insights into the present, uh, the, the findings. This will be the running order for today. Uh, in a moment, I will uh, welcome Ulana Makubela, Divisional Executive for the Retirement Fund Supervision at FSCA, and uh, uh, Adamu Labara, who is South Africa's Country Manager uh, um, for IFC. Then we'll have the presentation by IntelliDex, followed by a panel discussion of key representatives from the uh, retirement sector on both the fund side and asset consultant side to give us a sense of what the opportunities are up ahead. And then we will close out with a Q&A and we'll, we really look forward to your inputs. Uh, there, there's a lot of data, a lot to digest. Uh, we haven't, uh, uh, we haven't, uh, we won't be presenting all the findings from the report today. We really encourage you to have a look at the report online, but there's a lot of practical insights that can be used for future work. So we very much look forward to your feedback. So with that, I would like to uh, hand over to Alana, who will be providing us with opening remarks from the FSCA. Alana, over to you. Thank you so much, Louise, and good day, everyone. Uh, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great honor for me to deliver on behalf of the Financial Sector Conduct Authority a keynote speech at this forum. When I was told how many participants had signed up for this event, I was pleasantly surprised given the time of the year. I hope this is an indication of how eager you are to hear the results of the survey. I must take this time to thank the IFC, which is part of the World Bank Group, for collaborating with the FSCA to conduct the survey and for arranging this webinar to present the results. I would also like to thank IntelliDex for analyzing the data captured and preparing the findings that will be presented today. A special thank you to each and every retirement fund that took the time to complete the survey because without you, there would be no results to share today. We value your cooperation and recognize the effort you have made in submitting your responses. To representatives from National Treasury, the World Bank Group, Ministry of Environment in Germany, Institute of Retirement Funds, the World Bank Group, National Business Initiative, Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, Swedish International Development Corporation Agency, Cairon Trust Africa, Principles for Responsible Investment, Asset Consultants and Managers, thank you for your presence. From January to August 2020, Retirement Funds completed a survey titled Sustainable Finance Practices in South African Retirement Funds. The survey was aimed at capturing the current practices of South African Retirement Funds their strategic aspirations and their capacity building needs when it comes to sustainable finance. The information gathered would enable the FSCA to take stock of progress on sustainable investing by South African retirement funds and identify barriers and opportunities to unlock the significant potential for green investment. When Regulation 28 of the Pension Funds Act was issued in 2011, it required all retirement funds to have an investment policy statement 
and for boards of management to consider ESG factors before investing in an asset. Much has happened since 2011, such as the increased awareness of the effects of climate change on the financial sector, environment, and society. Fast forward to 2019, the FSCA issued guidance notice one of 2019 to provide retirement funds with guidance on how to comply with the ESG principle in Regulation 28. The guidance notice didn't just create a lot of meetings for me and my team, but it seemed to generate discussion in the industry on the integration of ESG factors in investment decisions. We don't mind the meetings if they bring about necessary change. This seemed to have also led to fora being created by retirement funds and industry associations to find ways to implement the requirements of the guidance notice. A draft technical paper was issued by the National Treasury in May 2020, titled Financing a Sustainable Economy. The paper appeared to echo some of the challenges articulated by the industry regarding the integration of ESG, such as difficulty in identifying appropriate investment vehicles, lack of track record on returns of such investment, and lack of adequate proof that such investment initiatives achieve their objectives. The paper recommended, amongst others, that regulators should issue guidance or regulatory instruments on sustainable finance, that all investment decisions made by retirement funds should consider environmental and social factors, as well as climate risk with implications for the training of boards, trustees, and actuaries, as well as investment managers. That regulators should co-develop or adopt guidance for the identification and monitoring of compliance with the sustainable finance framework and the responsible investment and ownership guide. And lastly, that regulators should amend requirements for annual financial statements and other reports to ensure the disclosure, monitoring, and reporting of responsible finance. You will be pleased to know that some of these recommendations have already been implemented in South Africa. The updated Responsible Investment and Ownership Guide has been issued to assist boards of management to integrate ESG factors into investment decisions. The FSCA is in the process of incorporating the reporting requirements in the annual financial statements of funds. And the FSCA Conduct Standard 4 of 2020, dealing with minimum skills and training requirements for board members of retirement funds was issued in July 2020. Retirement funds have an important role to play as institutional investors in the economy. Boards of management are being called upon not only to create returns for their members, but to create sustainable returns. The era of having profit or return maximization as the sole goal of a company is behind us. In 2020, at the onset of the global spread of COVID-19, the financial markets experienced a deep slump. COVID-19 laid bare the societal challenges faced by the majority of citizens in South Africa. Around the world and in South Africa, sustainable investing or financing became a typical issue. We have to rebuild our economies, but there is an understanding that we cannot rebuild on the same foundation. We must build a more resilient and sustainable economy. I'm sure by now you, become, you have become familiar with the term building back better. As Jane Goodall says, what you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you want to make. A retirement fund aligning its investment goals with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals is imperative. The reality is that members of retirement funds are impacted by the lack of quality education, lack of racial and gender diversity, lack of gender pay parity, lack of clean water and sanitation, lack of affordable and clean energy, and the stubborn presence of poverty. Over the past 50 years, the average global temperature has increased at the fastest rate in recorded history. Corruption is a worldwide phenomenon that compromises world peace and stability, and extreme poverty is expected to rise for the first time in 20 years. In 2019, we saw Australia burning and losing 8 million hectares of land and nearly 3 billion animals. 
Heavy rains, heat waves, earthquakes, and typhoons made Japan the most threatened in the world by climate change. Somalia was named the most corrupt country again, according to the Corruption Perception Index. And South Africa is the country with the highest inequality rate in the world. And there is still a narrative that COVID-19 possibly jumped from wildlife to humans because of human encroachment of their natural habitat and how we treat animals. South Africa's retirement fund industry is one of the largest in the world, as Louise has indicated. The investment decisions of the country's retirement funds have a direct and indirect bearing on pensioners and the environment they will retire in. Nobody wants to retire in a wasteland. Transitioning to a more sustainable and responsible economy will require significant investment and consequently private sources of capital on a very large scale. Therefore, South African retirement funds play and will continue to play a pivotal role in directing capital to investments that take environmental, social, and governance factors seriously. The president has asked for your assistance. With that said, and in conclusion, we will be taking the recommendations from the findings of the survey and engaging with the relevant stakeholders to see how best we can address the shortcomings in the current environment that boards of management operate in. 10 years ago, the National Treasury and the regulator provided the framework for positive change, and we will continue to provide guidance. We hope that boards of management and other industry stakeholders will engage with the recommendations of the survey with a view of finding solutions to the current challenges. We should not wait for legislation to do the right thing. This is your moment as an industry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alana. Uh, that's a very inspiring uh, set of challenges. And I think we're all feeling the urgency. I think climate change has definitely risen on the agenda in terms of work that needs to be done, not just over the next 10 years, but in the next year or two to put things in place so that we are responding actively. Uh, and there's a lot of work being done in different parts of South, South Africa's sec uh, financial sector and beyond that we do have the ingredients to make that all come together. Uh, so I'd like to now introduce uh, South Africa's country manager, uh, um, uh, IFC's country manager for South Africa, Mr. Adamu Labara. Uh, Adamu has been uh, on the front of the front line of conversations between IFC and the World Bank and financial sector uh, regulators and other stakeholders in South Africa exactly on this topic to help South Africa prepare for green and climate finance opportunities. So, Adamu, I'd like to invite you to say some opening remarks. Thank you very much, Luis, for, for setting the stage. And, and thank you, Ulanu, for your inspiring opening remarks. So, for me, it's a pleasure to collaborate with South Africa's Financial Sector Conduct Authority on this very, very exciting topic. I will also want to thank IntelliDex on the great work they have done, as Louise mentioned at the beginning, to analyze the results of the survey. I would like also to thank the panelists for today's discussion. They will be bringing an important perspective on the sustainable finance opportunity. I will also join Olano and thank SECO, the Swiss State Secretariat for Economic Affairs, and SIDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency for their support to IFC Green Bond Market Development Program. Now, as we look to rebuild the COVID, uh, from the COVID-19 crisis, we must focus on how to do so inclusively and sustainably. The pandemic has taken a heavy toll on many lives and livelihoods. It has exposed gaps that were already emerging, such as access to healthcare systems, critical services from education to power, as well as, as, well as vulnerabilities in our supply chains. The pandemic provides an opportunity for all of us to reassess how we want to build our economies and societies and our contribution to that process. And I join Olan, who, who made, who stressed this very important uh, uh, topic. In South Africa, the, the investment community has 
an important role to play. Retirement funds manage a significant portion of all investment assets in the country. It is the fifth largest pool of retirement capital worldwide. How retirement funds decide to invest, to invest can lead to very, very powerful outcomes. Now, more than ever, it's time for investment managers to mobilize capital into investment that target measurable positive social, economic, or environmental social alongside financial returns. In fact, the 2012 update to Regulation 28 placed new requirements on South African retirement funds to integrate environmental and social factors across all asset management activities. It also shifted the responsibility more onto your shoulder to understand and guide the outcomes and impact of your investment. IFC experienced something similar when we realized we have an unavoidable obligation to ensure that all our investments are done in a responsible way. We must not just be providers of, providers of capital, but also influencers of outcomes. As part of this work, IFC has issued more than 10 billion US dollars across 172 green bonds in 20 currencies worldwide. In addition, IFC plays a leadership role in developing guidance, guidelines and procedures for the green bond market as a member of the Green Bond Principle Executive Committee and a member of the International Finance Institution Green Bonds Impact Reporting Harmonization Framework. Now, with the establishment of the operating principle for impact management, we hope to work with a much broader universe of private investors like you and development finance institutions to mobilize the trillions of dollars in financing necessary to achieve the sustainable development goals Olano alluded to. We are proud that many of the lessons and practices we have learned and put in place have been adopted and continue to evolve in the broader financial sector globally and also here in South Africa. Our portfolio shows that selecting investee companies that are good environmental and social performance and working with them to improve that performance over time leads to better returns in our investment overall. This is a powerful finding, which has been confirmed by other leading investors around the world. We are proud to be supporting the FSCA to assess the current sustainable finance practices of South Africa's retirement funds and to find ways to unlock and inspire an increase in sustainable investment coupled with sustainable returns. Global development challenges proposed by climate change require urgent action and the private sector can deliver the investment needed to spur innovation and create thriving market for climate smart industries. A, uh, 2016 IFC study estimated that South Africa's climate start investment potential in selected sector is more than US 558 billion between uh, 2016 and 2030, as Louise mentioned in, when she was setting the stage. These form part of a larger subsequent study which identify over USD 29 trillion in climate investment opportunity in emerging markets, cities globally by 2030 across six urban sectors, green buildings, public transport infrastructure, electric vehicles, improved management of water resources, renewable energy, and better handling of waste. It is therefore exciting to see that of the 150 plus retirement funds that responded to the FSCA IFC survey, a majority are already investing in green asset classes and at 
and are interested to commit collective targets to do more. We'll be hearing more about the findings shortly, so I don't want to give away too much. However, the headlines for me is that South African retirement funds, thanks to Regulation 28 and guidance from the FSCA, are now well prepared to be a driver of green and climate finance and to support the transition to a just, green, and low-carbon economy. IFC looks forward to continuing to be a partner with you on this journey and to help address some of the remaining barriers to this new frontier. As Louise mentioned at the beginning, South Africa has been for IFC a trendsetter in many areas. So we are convinced that this will be the case for sustainable finance in retirement sector. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Adamu. Uh, that's, uh, I think, one of the things that uh, IFC tries to bring in its engagements with uh, the South African financial sector is a reminder that South Africa is quite a leader in many respects and can be proud of, of everything it's achieved so far, as well as having opportunities to, to do some very exciting things in the next in the coming years. So with that, I'd like to invite uh, uh, Grant Kruger, the CEO of Intellidex USA and Global Lead Strategy and Research to present the findings from the survey that was conducted this year. So Grant also brings very useful background in the financial sector. He has extensive background in financial services, product innovation and research, and has worked for several financial services businesses. He is the former head of enterprise development at Standard Bank. Uh, a specialist finance unit created to facilitate access to finance for black owned small businesses in corporate value chains. Uh, so, so Grant has led from the IntelliDex offices in uh, the US. He has led this research. IntelliDex also has offices in Johannesburg and London. So Grant, over to you. Very good to be with you. And uh, thank you, Louise, for having me and for um, our team to be able to present the findings and the results of this very important study. Hello to all the attendees and to all the panelists as well. Thank you for joining us. And again, I'd like to echo the, the words of gratitude from Louise and Olano. Um, a very special thank you to everyone for participating in this study and making it possible for us to bring you the results today. Um, I would also like to thank many, many of the funds and the respondents from those funds for your enduring patience as we were working for, um, for months and months to ensure the accuracy and the integrity of the data that I'm presenting for you today. Uh, as Louise has mentioned, my name is Dr. Grant Kruger. I look after strategy research um, at IntelliDex, and that includes our work on sustainable finance. We are a financial services and capital market research firm focused on Africa, and we service clients globally from our offices in Santon, from London, and from Boston. Um, I run the Boston office, and I'm in DC for a little while, uh, to, uh, and that's why I'm presenting um, the results to you from today. So it is my pleasure to share these results with you on such a large scale study. And um, just a reminder that our research explored those opportunities that uh, are in front of our retirement funds in South Africa, how they can unlock the investments for green finance and for climate finance, and also then, of course, to support a resilient economy. By way of overview, um, I'm going to start with sharing uh, just a few key highlights from some of the findings. These were ones that stood out to us that were either surprising or enlightening. And I'm, I'm hoping um, that you'll validate my views on this um, because I've certainly found these absolutely astounding. So let me not let me not uh, play them up too much and see how you react to these numbers that we'll be sharing with you today. Um, when we have uh, looked at some of those key findings, there'll only be six of those. I will then give you a brief overview of who these uh, respondents are um, and what the funds, uh, retirement funds look like in the survey of uh, 140 of them. There are also an additional 22 funds that we called the partial respondents in this in the study. Now, why did we have to come up with this invented name? Well. In all my years of research, I've, I've really honestly never seen anything like this, where 22 of the of the retirement funds were unable to complete the full survey um, as we had designed it. But we got input from these 22 funds to explain some of the challenges, the challenges that they've encountered, not just with completing the survey, but also generally some of the challenges that they have 
in sustainable finance um, and in ensuring ESG compliance of their funds as well. So we've created a special category in the report for those 22 funds. We believe that there's such valuable information that even those folks who sent us the letters of explanation, um, we've been able to harness some of the data from even those letters. And they're incredibly valuable and interesting to explore alongside the findings of the main respondents in the study. So um, for the rest of the, uh, the feedback to you, I'm going to briefly, briefly give you some key um, insights and findings on the, on the six big themes that we explored in the survey. The first one is an exploration of the nascent interest in green and climate focused finance. So as you know, green finance refers to the financing of investments that provide environmental benefits as well as financial returns. Then we move on to explore some findings in investments in sustainably or sustainability themed bonds. Um, none of the uh, oh, sorry, only one of the segments um, that the sustainable finance has grown rapidly is this one. So this sustainably sustainability themed bonds is an area that we've seen recently and globally to have grown uh, by, by staggering amounts. For example, in 2019, the global figure uh, for these um, uh, types of bonds was $275 billion. That was in 2019 and the market continues to grow. Today, we will be exploring the extent to which um, South Africa is participating uh, in this growing uh, market for sustainability themed bonds. The third um, theme that we'll be exploring uh, today very quickly as well, will be uh, the strategic outlook. So as you know, from, from, com from completing the survey or any of the uh, communications that we've sent out about the survey, it's that we aimed to capture some of the sustainable finance practices of the funds currently, but also some of the aspirations for the future and where there are opportunities for potential um, collaboration with other investors or between uh, the retirement funds themselves. The next theme that we look at um, is going to be on the funds approach to ESG integration. As you all know, and has been reiterated today as well, Regulation 28 of the pension funds Act require that funds must consider factors that could materially affect the sustainable long-term performance of the fund's assets. And by that, we mean it must now include factors of environment, social, and governance, or as we call it, ESG. Um, and this is often referred to as ESG integration. So we'll get into a bit of detail on that. Then we move on to uh, reporting on implementation and impact. In this, um, again, also short section, uh, we will capture the practices of retirement funds to implement and to monitor the, the activities on ESG integration. And that will be across all of the asset classes in line with Regulation 28. We also, for the first time, are able to report some allocations of these investments, and we are able to, to give you a sense of where we are seeing um, implications for environment and social impacts um, already. Finally, our last theme will then be on capacity building. We ask the funds in the research as well, but where they may need help and support. And so that's the, the final theme that we'll explore today in terms of how, these, how the funds can move forward um, in growing their sustainable finance practices. And Louise has already said this to you, but it, there is a plenty of detail on, on all of these themes and all of these findings in the report. So I will really just be um, giving you a, a bit of a taste and hopefully excite you to, to read the detail in the report. There, there were 140 respondents to the survey, and we asked 120 questions. So that's quite a substantial um, data set and report that you're going to be able to get into um, in quite a bit of detail following today's presentation. So just to draw your attention to some of the key um, and main findings, um, as we've already um, said, that in terms of coverage of the survey, um, there are about 4.26 trillion assets, uh, the value of assets under management in South African pensions funds is at that number, 4.26 trillion rand. Um, it is the fifth largest pension market in the world, and our survey covers 3.17 trillion of those funds, or 74% of the funds that are represented in the country. Then on to some other interesting findings in the study, um, the results, like I said to you, that really stood out for us. Here's a good example, the top one on the, on the top right there. Um, for example, retirement funds reported that they already have over 40 billion rand invested in green assets. We think that number is potentially underreported, but, but we've, from the results of the survey, that was the number that we calculated. Uh, but we think there's probably um, some work to be done 
that can give us a more accurate number to, to what we're reporting today, but this is the beginning. You'll see some of the challenges that we uncover in this research that point to why our assumption is that it's probably underreported because so many funds told us that they either have don't have the mechanisms or the data to be able to give us accurate reporting, but those that do have the data were able to report, and that's the number. Next, take a look. 81% of investments, or 81% of the retirement funds rather, have investments in renewable energy. Then, this number. Nearly all, all at 99%, not quite 100, but 99% of the retirement funds tell us that they have an investment policy statement. And I think that will make the FSCA very happy to understand that the, the guidance notice one of, of 2019 um, has seen this level of, of compliance. So the funds have reported that they do have those IPSs in place. Then, like I said, the one big theme in the, in the research as well is forward looking. And we can tell you that 82% of the funds are reporting to us in the survey that they would be willing to increase allocations to green and climate focused investments. My apologies for this slide, which is a bit text heavy. I know that we like to see visuals and the risk of people reading the slide is a very real one, but this one bears reading because these, in our view, are the key challenges that we uncovered from 120 questions across 140 survey respondents. Here is the nub of the issue. These are the challenges we've identified, and we'd like to draw your attention to some of the recommendations we make for how to deal with those big challenges. Let's look at number one, um, and we'll look at them each one in turn. There is a lack of agreed, consistent industry definitions and data for tracking green, social, and sustainability-focused assets and investments. That is back to the point that I made earlier about the, the, the 40 billion rand and why we believe it's underreported. Here, here is the challenge that we've identified. We recommend that, that, the, that there should be an agreed national taxonomy for green, social, and related sustainability-focused finance, which would then help to facilitate a harmonized monitoring and reporting. Can't emphasize that enough, the extent to which funds um, felt challenged by the lack of this kind of taxonomy. It, this can then further reduce the costs and, the increase, uh, and increase the value of the data provided to retirement funds. A second major challenge we'd like to draw your attention to is there, are, there is an insufficient pipeline of green, climate, and sustainability-focused investments that meet the requirements of these funds. And those requirements are, are sufficient projects, good governance, and liquidity. What do we recommend? I guess this is a little bit obvious, but we highly recommend that a suitable pipeline is needed to match the growing interest and appetite among South African retirement funds to allocate capital to sustainable assets. Challenge number three, we found that constraints were expressed by pooled and retail funds in being able to influence ESG mandates of investments. This particular challenge was identified to us by those funds that I mentioned that we've labeled the partial respondents, those 22 funds. This is a key challenge for them. So we recommend that it should be, or we believe there's a need for coordination between retirement funds and asset managers um, and potentially looking at collective ambitions and, and some kind of collective or group working um, model that can be developed there to help to unlock those constraints and the pooled and, re and retail funds. Challenge number four, we found that green and climate focused investing aspirations need to consider social development in South Africa's economy. Now, this is an interesting one because even in other research that we've done um, as IntelliDex, we found that South African respondents will tell us the acronym ESG should probably in the South African context actually be called SGE for social governance and then environment. An interesting insight there, but uh, this again reinforces that idea as well, that even though we're talking green and climate focused finance, they cannot be considered in isolation or in absence of the social development of the country. So what do we recommend? We recommend that more um, uh, that half of the funds that have indicated a willingness to reduce their exposure to coal-related assets and to increase those allocations to green and climate-focused finance, those needs can be achieved through a just and gradual transition and with a very strong, and I can't underline this enough, focus on job creation in these new green sectors. Challenge number five, the integration of ESG and sustainable finance strategies requires new expertise. We've understood that, and this is a very strong message that's come through from the studies, from the research. We recommend that there should be continued efforts to build awareness and capacity among retirement fund trustees 
principal executive officers, asset consultants, and the various asset managers. So those folks are the key challenges and recommendations that have come through from this vast study. Um, some of these points we've already indicated or mentioned, so I'll briefly just reiterate them. 140 respondents in the questionnaire, and we ran the study between February and August of 2020. Um, I've already said that we've got three, uh, just over 3.1 uh, trillion uh, of the assets under management in the country. Let's take a, take a look bottom left at the, the main function of respondents. You'll see there that even though our survey intended to focus on principal uh, or executive officers and trustees, we did find that in many funds that there were other respondents that potentially had a, a, a much more narrow um, focus on ESG or sustainability issues in those funds. And in terms of um, the fund types, uh, just to mention that briefly, 87% um, of the vast majority of the funds are private. And um, on you'll see the split there on the with the circle on the far right, that the pension funds uh, make up 43% um, and the provident funds also 43%. So between those two, 86% of the respondents are represented um, by those two categories. Quickly again about those partial respondents, like I said to you as well, 22 funds that did not respond, um, but they did represent 111 billion rands worth of assets under management, so not to be taken lightly. And um, those funds in terms of profile, 85% of them are private, and then uh, a slight majority of them are ordinary funds, 35% of them are umbrella funds. And if you indulge me quickly, I want to just bring to your attention some of the, the challenges that they highlighted in their feedback to us. So first, in terms of um, fund strategies, they said as members um, who, that, that elect to invest in unit trusts and unitized pool portfolios, those are their members that make those decisions. So there is a need for funds to have direct active ownership policies as the funds are not the owners of the underlying assets that are included in those portfolios, and they do not have the right um, to, uh, to attend or vote at meetings of issuers that are underlying those assets. So, in essence, this means that they have no control over the underlying investments held by the pooled managers of those portfolios. Secondly, in terms of details, they find it difficult to obtain the level of detail that, that are required uh, for these pooled funds to be able to report what we needed for the study. Again, availability of trusted um, information and data on green and climate focused investments, and also this need for a standardized reporting that needs to be implemented across um, asset managers and then back into the funds and into the trustees. There was also a concern about time and cost that because these funds don't have um, readily available information, completing a survey like the one that we've proposed was um, going to be timely and costly or uh, time consuming and very costly for them. But again, that just comes back to the point about the fact that these funds do not have the, have the funds, or at least the data available to them to be able to participate and report on those numbers. Then an interesting um, response here as well was the question of relevance of this particular research for those kinds of funds. Um, certainly we respect that the, the vast majority of funds will be institutional funds, and perhaps the, the, the survey was more directed to those funds. However, like I said, in terms of these pooled uh, funds or these um, uh, retail investment funds, we still need to be able to bring them into the fold. And so uh, there's an aspect of how we need to refine future research to be able to, to adequately cater for, the, for their practices as well. Um, now moving into some of the more um, detailed findings on some of the big themes, here's our first one, the nascent interest in green and, and climate focused finance. I will mention very quickly, as you look at these results in terms of the, of the two graphs that you see on many of these slides, you'll see that they often say weighted and unweighted. Now, the reason for that is because if you can imagine the, 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 the fund uh, assets under management in the country at 4.26 trillion, some funds are much larger than others. So in the study, we were fortunate to have um, the, uh, the Government Employee Pension Fund or GEPF for short, participated in the study, and that is certainly the behemoth on the continent, it was over about 1.3 trillion rands worth of, of assets under management by itself. We needed to do weighted and unweighted results for um, a, a, a one, or two, a one or two reasons. One was to ensure that, that funds, that we were taking account of funds assets under management. And so essentially, you can think of it as assigning one vote 
per one rand of investment. And so what we did was, in terms of the fund's assets under management, we weighted those um, results based on the funds under management. So each rand gets a vote, essentially. But then, because of the GPF and its scale, we needed to limit the large funds in terms of their influence on the results. And we capped the larger funds at 25% of their weighting. Doing that means that, or let me put it the other way, if we hadn't done that, all we would be reporting would be many results purely of the, of the GEPF because it is so big. That's why we needed to cap them at 25%. But also, if you look at these results, what is interesting about doing it in a weighted and an unweighted fashion is that you will see a difference in many of these results between the larger and the smaller funds. So you, you'll often hear us in the report or even in the presentation that I'm doing for you now that we refer to weighted and unweighted and sometimes draw your attention to where we're picking up differences between larger and smaller funds, which is borne out by our weighting of some of these results. Now, Onto the findings on this slide in terms of green um, uh, and climate uh, finance policies, the funds tell us that um, that they have that they uh, have got. Um, in, it's, sorry, specifically about this question: Does your fund have a specific policy or a component of the IPS that supports investments in green or climate finance? Well, they tell us most of the funds you'll see both from an unweighted perspective and even more so from a weighted perspective that they do um, have, do not have specific policies that uh, support investment or green and climate finance. You'll see that this is even uh, more emphasized on the weighted results, that they do not have such a policy in place. We also um, found this particular uh, result very interesting. In terms of the assets that funds have invested in, I I along their green and climate portfolios, Take a look at the far left with that result, and I'll read that for you. It's utility scale renewables. 36% of the funds told us that they have some investments in um, utility scale renewables. And then the next one is small or off-grid um, embedded uh, projects in terms of renewables as well. So that is 22%. Renewable energy then is by far the most popular category of green and climate focused assets and investments by the retirement funds. Our next slide actually shows us the values that we were able to capture in this research. And not only was renewable um, energy or renewable scale, utility scale energy, the biggest, uh, 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 had the biggest number of funds invested, but also in terms of value, we're seeing that number come through at a staggering nearly 40 uh, billion rands worth of investments in, in that particular asset. And the, the rest of them um, then have very small proportions of the, of the funds invested. Right. We asked in this particular question about the specific amounts invested. And again, with, with, with respect to all the constraints that we've highlighted in the research so far, of availability of data and all of the, all of the, the challenges that the funds had, we're still able and comfortable and, and really happy to be able to bring this result to the table. We suspect, like I said, it's underreported and potentially that, that when we improve the taxonomy and the reporting of this data, we'll probably be able to give a better and more accurate picture but here's a start, even, even with our perspective that it's probably underreported, 40 billion is sitting in utility scale renewable energy generation. Now, a further level of detail, where are we seeing those funds going in terms of specific types of technologies? Um, if you look at the results there, wind at 64%, solar at 57%. Also, again, just a, a note about how to read these results. You'll obviously notice that some of them don't add up to 100. Um, many of them don't, but that's because the funds could um, record more than one uh, investment. So in other words, a fund could have had an investment in wind, solar and biomass, which is why you're seeing these numbers. But wind certainly the biggest one. When we talk green and climate focused um, investments, um, it's impossible not to bring coal into the conversation. Most funds will have reported to us that they do invest in coal mining or some aspect of the coal value chain, whether it's coal logistics or coal fire, uh, coal fired power plants. But again, we also think this is potentially underreported because of the nature of the construction of portfolios and the fact that funds often don't have a full view through to all of the underlying assets um, sitting in some of their portfolios. 
This is something that I think we would love to hear from the panelists about in terms of their um, views on, on what we're seeing here, especially with regards to the coal value chain levels of investment um, and the um, potential challenges that funds have in terms of the view through to be able to report um, accurate data. A little bit more detail further on coal mining and then the coal value chain in particular. Um, coal mining, uh, as you see there, in terms of the numbers we were able to collect, nearly 11 billion rand um, has been invested in coal mining, coal mining. and then coal-fired uh, coal power plants, almost 5 billion. Coal logistics, just over 2 billion rands worth of investment in that area. You'll see from the number of responses that we've been able to collect, we, we've made that really very clear that you, even though we've had about 140 respondents in the, in the study, there's a, a large number of them that either told us that the numbers were unknown or that it wasn't applicable to their portfolio. But again, a substantial number have been able to report uh, any of their, the figures that they had available to them. Moving on to sustain, sustainability themed bonds and the investments that we are seeing there. Firstly, let's take a look at um, this particular, uh, the findings on, this, on, on these results here. One of the segments of sustainable finance that has grown most rapidly in recent years, as we've said before, is green bonds. And that number, as I mentioned earlier, is sitting roughly at about $257 um, billion globally. Following this example, social and sustainability themed bonds have also become very popular in South Africa. Green and social bonds, um, by definition, are any type of bond instrument where the proceeds will be exclusively applied to finance or refinance, in part or in full any new or existing projects in, that relate to the environment, i.e. green assets or social benefits um, that may also form part of this portfolio. Sustainability bonds combine assets with both green and social benefits and are commonly associated with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. If you look at the graphs um, in front of you now, on your left, you'll see the investments in green, social or sustainability themed bonds. The, the results that we found here is that a, a larger number of retirement funds do in fact invest in um, green social and sustainability themed bonds than, um, than, than we had anticipated in, in the original uh, uh, study that we, when we set up these, uh, these questions. We found here that about 24% of them on a weighted basis actually do have those investments already. So furthermore, we, you'll see from the graph on the, on the right hand side that vanilla bonds still are the most favored type of bond in the market and funds have invested almost 10 times more in vanilla bonds than in green, sustainable or social bonds. We have found in, as part of the findings here that 95% or 95 funds rather have local investments in vanilla bonds and 91 of those funds have sustainability themed bonds in their portfolio already. Looking forward in terms of the strategic outlook from these funds, like I mentioned, our survey aimed to capture some of the current um, sustainable finance practices of the retirement funds. Um, and here we are now able to report some of their future aspirations, as well as the potential for collaboration um, between themselves and potentially between other investors as well. In particular, we found it very fascinating that there seems to be an overall willingness to commit to collective targets and to collectively increasing exposure to these kinds of investments in sustainable, um, sustainable and responsible assets. So although funds um, told us that they do not generally have targets for sustainable investments, just over half of the respondents indicated their willingness to increase investments in positive social impact green and climate investments, while at the same time looking at reducing their exposure in coal-related investments. Again, the, like I, I'll draw your attention to these, uh, the fact that we're looking at weighted results here. So um, if, you, if you go into the detail in the report, you'll see that we report unweighted and weighted. And here, here are some of the findings on the weighted results. So just to look quickly at, um, at one, of, one of these um, results there, you'll see on the far left, reducing exposure to coal related um, investments that the funds are telling us that they are, are willing to, to um, undertake those investments and reduce those uh, um, exposures. So 
On to um, a few more findings on this particular uh, perspective of, of the strategic outlook. We find here, for example, that, um, that most funds are telling us that they are interested um, in uh, sustainable development goals, but have not yet aligned to those goals. So 92% of the funds tell us that there's an interest, but the alignment hasn't, hasn't happened in practice uh, for, for many of these funds. Now, interestingly, would you be willing to support a long-term pledge in the pension fund and the retirement fund industry of South Africa towards sustainability-focused investments? And look at that overwhelming majority of funds are telling us, yes, they would be interested in supporting that. On to our next theme, um, the approach to ESG integration. Um, I'll just highlight a, a couple of the, of the findings here. Um, Regulation 28, like we've mentioned already, uh, of the Pension Funds Act requires that funds consider any factors that could materially affect the sustainable long-term performance of a fund's assets. Now, in terms of the integration of, of ESG considerations, um, we know that it's become, and funds recognize that it's become global good practice to include those as part of fiduciary duty. And we, we also understand that it's a core component of responsible investing and sustainable finance. In practice, ESG integration includes risk management, active ownership, engagement with, which means the engagement with investee companies, obviously, and also a focus on investing in companies and sectors that perform well on ESG criteria. Such considerations try to keep both long-term financial performance and ESG sustainability in mind as investment decisions are made and portfolios are reviewed on an ongoing basis. In 2019, the FSCA issued guidance notice one, um, which they called sustainability of investments and, and assets in the context of retirement funds investment policy statements. Here we see some of those results. Um, we see here, for example, whether the question of was whether funds have um, already included uh, in their investment policy statements issues of ESG integration. And if you look at the weighted results, um, it, the overwhelming majority, 99%, nearly 100% told us yes, that they already have included that. Um, it's a slight shift when you look at unweighted results, but it's, it's not major. It, it's still a very, very overwhelming majority. So in the interest of time, I'll move on to some of the other um, interesting findings. Uh, further also on ESG integration, the majority of funds told us that they do already engage in periodic reviews of ESG risks um, at their portfolio levels, uh, at the portfolio level in their, um, uh, in their ongoing practice. And this is followed closely by having formal inclusion of ESG integration in the asset managers and mandates. So those two findings are the biggest ones um, on the far left of the graph there. Um, just a, a few brief um, insights on, on some of the, the other themes and some of the key issues that emerged from the research. We found, um, for example, that for green and climate investments, funds say they lack products and um, a product pipeline rather, or an investment portfolio that they can invest in, um, and they have difficulty with monitoring and reporting. Retirement funds are also um, indicating that they are asking their asset managers to align to the sustainable development goals. Again, we haven't, we're finding that they have not yet quite aligned, but it seems to be that the work is in getting asset managers to align, and then we'll start to see that filter into the portfolios themselves, but there's a very strong desire to align to the SDGs. Next one, in terms of ESG integration, retirement funds say that they are most limited by poor quality data, followed by a lack of best practice guidelines. Finally, funds tell us that they require support to establish the appropriate monitoring and reporting systems, and also they need help to set up systems to assess ESG risks, either in their portfolios currently or in potential investments that they may undertake. And with that, I thank you for your participation and for your time today, and I will hand back to Louise. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Grant. Uh, there was a lot of information to take in. Uh, I think one of the things that was confirmed to us when we asked for feedback from uh, representatives of the retirement sector on our initial findings is that it's only these are only scratching the surface. Uh, it was the survey's main finding is it's difficult to get, collect this data. Most asset managers don't have it, and they're the ones that the um, that the, the retirement funds rely on to provide this data. 
because there hasn't been a standardized reporting framework, because everyone don't, uh, isn't using the same definitions, we knew it was going to be difficult. So we really appreciate it. It's much easier to go through a portfolio and an unlisted portfolio of projects and identify which ones qualify. Uh, so green bonds, that's why we think that's such an interesting trend. It's an easy win. You know it's green. You don't have to uh, explain further. Uh, uh, but certainly for funds that are mainly exposed through, for instance, listed equities, it's much harder to tease out uh, what your exposures are. So we do think it is uh, just the tip of the iceberg, uh, but a very useful place to start. So with that, I'm going to invite our panelists to respond to the findings. I'm very pleased to introduce our four panelists today, which represent different parts of the financial sector. So we have Belen and Nagash from research analyst, for, uh, ESG research analyst from the uh, Government Employees Pension Fund. We have Pramal Ranchard, head of ESG research at Alexander Forbes. We have Hamotso Ramukala, principal officer at Telcom Retirement Fund. And Kubis Hanukum, who will be representing the Batseta Commercial Fund Forum. So in the meantime, let me introduce uh, Belen and Nagash, research analyst at uh, ESG research analyst at GEPF. She started her sustainability journey in 2012 and has extensive experience in responsible investing, policy and framework development and impact measurement. And she's passionate about engaging investee companies and conducting research on ESG risks. Helena has served on the United Nations PRI Human Rights Steering Committee and is currently serving on the series Water Task Force. So Helena, I'd like to invite you to kick us off. What did you think of the results? Do they resonate with your experience uh, as one of the respondents to the survey? And what do you see as the opportunities ahead, given the fact that GEPF has been a leader in the space for some time, and you have put in place many of the systems that are required to do proactive green and, and climate finance? I found the, the survey to be quite intensive, filling them out. Um, information gathering was also quite a mission. Um, we had to go back and forth between um, our asset manager and, you know, verifying those numbers again and again, um, simply because of the fact that the our, our um, investments are not exactly, you know, written exactly how how the survey questions were so um but it definitely did um give us food for thoughts and um definitely is something that um will assist us moving forward with also monitoring and evaluating and also ease of um of reporting so thank you for that so um, i've just got a couple of slides that i'd like to go through um my name is Belaine Nagash. I'm a research analyst at the Government Employees Pension Fund. Um, I'd just like to discuss who's the fund, uh, our approach to responsible investing, how we invest, um, our green assets, research and the SDGs, and then finally I would like to, to conclude. So who is the GPF? We're the largest pension fund in Africa, 480,000 pensioners and beneficiaries, 1.2 million contributing members and um, 1.8 trillion assets under management. And also we have been a founding signatory to the, the PRI since 2006. We are also defined benefit fund. So our approach to responsible investing starts off from a strategic, rev, uh, strategic um, level, which is which is the responsible investing policy. So this policy is an umbrella policy that um, you know, ensures that responsible investing issues are integrated into investment decisions and ownership practices in a manner consistent with our strategic objectives. And we also believe that this leads to enhanced returns for our portfolio. A number of key factors support this belief, such as our um, 14 year membership to, to PRI and also um, external frameworks such as the NDP and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So through that, we also have the RI, our Responsible Investing Management Framework, which allows us practically to integrate ESG factors um, and into our, our investment decisions to ensure long-term sustainability of the fund. We also um, uh, require that 
that the fund um, and asset and our asset managers develop knowledge of ESG risks and opportunities to integrate and consider these factors alongside traditional financial information. Through that, we also um, look at the fact that we recognize that the fund's investments should also play a developmental role. So um, just a quick snapshot with the responsible investing policy, we use ESG screening as part of, of due diligence. We evaluate ESG risks, monitor these ESG um, activities of, of the fund, we, um, sorry, of investee companies. We measure how companies improve over time. We engage with these companies and also um, report to our stakeholders. Having said that, how does the fund invest? So we've, like, as I mentioned earlier, we've got the responsible investing policy, which is applied to all asset classes. Um, we, we invest in all um, asset classes as well. And then we've got three main mandates. And I think this was really how um, this created the difficulty in reporting uh, uh, in the survey, because we've got a mandate for listed investment, unlisted investments, and developmental investments. And um, for purposes of today's discussion, um, we will be focused on developmental investments. So the developmental investment policy came about through the thinking that we are the largest investor in the country and we also um, have the goal of investing for financial return but also wanting social economic and environmental returns so that was really the nexus point uh, in that dual goal of investing um, obviously we cannot compromise on financial returns and the needs, we are aware that there is key economic and social development needs in South Africa. And the evidence backing that was that there is a lack of funding um, in these specific areas. So when the developmental investment policy came through, it, it was really, it is actually the foundation of the GPF's investments in economic infrastructure, social infrastructure, environmental infrastructure, and um, other priority sectors which uh, generate job creation. Our, port our developmental investment portfolio allocation um, comprises of 5% of the overall um, funds under management. And just as to give a brief overview of where we are invested, we've got 440 million um, invested in wind, 4.4 billion in solar, We've got also renewable energy, which um, Grant was um, had mentioned. We've got 5.1 billion invested in that. And we've also got the Environmental Sustainability Fund um, at 2 billion um, rand as well. And then as part of um, in the Energy Fund, which is 23 billion, we do have um, a cap of um, 50%, which could which could be allocated to um, renewables. So once again, Grant, that was the difficulty in putting all of this together. And then on the, the, the listed side, we've got the IDC Green Bond, which comes to 5 billion. All of this is monitored via an investment mandate, which um, we do have clear key developmental areas that need to be um, met by by our asset manager the, the PIC um, so just in terms of the facts you know we've got um, we've got um, finance theories we've got um, um, information we've got studies that say that you know what ESG creates um, financial performance and it also leads to lower cost of capital. So I'm just going to uh, run through these um, just in the interest of time. So in terms of the fund, we looked at what, what, what exactly are the risks that are out there. We've got um, five um, risks, uh, top five risks which relate to environmental risks. So we're seeing that the risk landscape is being shaped by climate change. And this 
tells us something as investors. The economic cost of climate change, um, developing countries will be um, penalized for not taking climate change into, into consideration. Leading economists state that the cost of rising global temperatures could be equal to a five to 10% decrease in GDP. And this applies to also developing countries, which will be in excess of 10% of that. And the impact on the environment and the health will cost about 20% um, reduction in per capita consumption. Climate risks are also increasing the cost of capital for developing countries. For every $10 that um, these countries pay, this results in interest payments as well. Um, we also have seen that um, researchers estimate that additional interest costs are set to rise between 146 billion to 168 billion over the next decade, which will, of course, exacerbate the economic challenges already faced by poor countries. Um, once again, how does that affect your portfolio? If you're invested in coal, in the coal subsector, you're more than likely to experience a reduction um, in expected returns of 6.6 to 5.4 percent per average over the next 35 years. So, what is what does this mean in doing the right thing? Um, I know that Olano did mention the just transition approach. Um, the statement was was um, written, and they said that there's an increasing recognition that investors have so have so far given insufficient attention to the social consequences of climate change. Um, why is climate change important to us um, in the South African context and globally? Um, adverse effects in terms of increased pressure on food security, water security, economic inequality, social inequality, and poor infrastructure. South Africa is 10% um, to 20% poorer because of climate change, simply of the because we are in a water scarce region, and um, we've got low income per capita, high levels of inequality, and a large reliance on climate sensitive sectors such as agriculture and related sectors, which is represented at about seven percent of GDP. So the so what question: What does that mean? So for our investments, this this means that we've got. Um, our uh, water sources are being affected by diversity, agriculture, forestry, human settlements, uh, human health, and of course, um, that also impacts our energy. The new way, um, having mentioned all the impacts that it would have on society, our, our, um, our, the way that we look at things is to align with the sustainable development goals. We endorse it. South Africa is also um, uh, signed to, to the, the SDGs. And we have also mapped our investments to see where we have direct and indirect impact in relation to the sustainable development goals. So in conclusion, um, this is an iterative process. You know, it, we're looking at it's the nexus point between the quantitative and qualitative measures. But once you have to start off with what do you believe in, what do the numbers say, what are the risks, what are the trends, and then you've got to set your strategy, um, develop your policies, frameworks, and of course, capacity building within your investments or your fund. And then you've got to evaluate, monitor, and use active ownership strategies. Thank you. Thank you so much, Belena. That was uh, immensely, immensely rich input. And Thank I think you. it's going to be very valuable to uh, funds who want to take a more proactive approach in the future. Uh, so really, thank you for putting together those slides. And uh, we're, we're pushed for time, but I think we, we can uh, move straight ahead to uh, Pramal Ranchard from the head of ESG research at Alexander Forbes Investments. Uh, and while I'm introducing him, Holly, if you can bring up uh, Pramal's slides on the screen. Uh, Pramal leads the responsible investment strategy at Alexander Forbes Investments, the largest multi-manager in South Africa, as, one of the as well as one of the largest asset owners in the country. He has engaged extensively with asset management industry over the years in manager selection across uh, 
uh, public and private markets and the various asset classes. Uh, so Pramal brings a very, very valuable uh, perspective in having been part of the process to respond to the survey on, an, uh, on behalf of a number of clients and also seeing where clients are thinking ahead in terms of this trend for the future. So Pramal, over to you. So sure, thank you, Louise, and thank you to the FSCA and the IFC for having Alexander Forbes on the panel. To my esteemed panelists, it's been a pleasure to collaborate with you. Firstly, I'd like to point out some of the our, our feedback in terms of the survey, the challenges, as well as the points that we, we found uh, quite interesting and were able to complete with relative ease. In, in assessing things such as the asset class exposure, uh, regulation 28 requirements, um, you know, points around, around what the IPS within retirement funds ought to suggest in terms of ESG, as well as the inclusion of ESG principles within the IPS. Those are points which we were very comfortable with. We have all that information, especially around regulation 28 uh, asset allocation data. The points around which Grant mentioned that, you know, data being a bottleneck, those are quite pertinent and, you know, more specifically around where we need further granularity, we'd have to approach the asset managers in, in obtaining that information. You know, and needless to say, I think as much as we don't, as pension funds, have that information or that we reach out to asset managers, there's a reporting uh, bottleneck in terms of what the companies themselves report whether it being listed companies on the JSC or the access to information from private companies. If I give you an example around what that means, you know, gaps around corporate reporting practices around fossil fuels, um, not detailed enough. Current practices won't tell you enough about segmental reporting of these. Um, you know, how, even if an asset manager were to tell you that these are coal-fired uh, assets, you wouldn't be able to then uh, further split that between the contribution of revenue of that business or whether it means coal as a function of the asset base within that particular company. So that granularity is not currently being reported. And you know, if you take it further afield from, from climate, if you look at the other aspects around reporting in the integrated reports, those are not necessarily comparative across different companies as well as different in industries. And as a result, you do get you know, some kind of patchy reporting uh, that comes through, but you, you, you kind of need to, to make a quilt out of that in order to get this complete picture. And it's not quite evident when you don't have a reporting framework that's um, coherent enough. And you know, as a result, for, for pension funds, it becomes quite challenging because you, you don't necessarily have that information at your disposal, but have to reach out and wait for these kinds of opportunity, uh, these kinds of information to make decisions as and when uh, investment committees meet. Um, and really, uh, you know, the taxonomy for disclosure, pension fund reporting in general is is a lot weaker, I'd say. If I took it further afield from the survey and I suggested uh, proxy voting, whilst we're aware that active management is, is being done within the industry, active stewardship, at least in terms of voting, I don't believe that there's sufficient granularity being reported around what those vote outcomes mean. You know, and insofar as saying for, hold or against, uh, for abstain or against votes, that doesn't give you the information to to better assess ESG risks or where the managers are doing it. And hence, you know, we believe in this active engagement with the managers in order to influence for positive outcomes. Looking at the observations and opportunities for the green bond market within South Africa, uh, looking at globally, so there's, there's a typo on this slide, but around 200 billion worth of uh, global assets in green bonds uh, has reported through the IFC survey, and I think it still pales in comparison to the traditional bond universe and the need for capital to address the challenges that society faces. Around the local aspect of it, there have been several issuances over, over the years of, of green bonds, but my, my feeling is that these are thinly traded and you don't find them being um, held quite, uh, quite widely despite the fact that they were fully subscribed or, or even, even to say as oversubscribed at the time when these bonds were floated. You know, looking at, at the investment industry, the, the consideration that asset managers will have you believe that locally or abroad, uh, they'll cite the trade-offs in, in holding green bonds that, uh, you know, corporate debt 
would, would be slightly more liquid compared to that. Uh, they, they, although these green bonds have similar spreads, there's less liquidity and hence, you know, not enough compelling reason for them to hold it when comparing the other asset allocation decisions that a manager would face um, in, in his investment outcomes. And they're balancing these benchmark risks, elevated opportunities um, that, that, that is available to them. But, you know, locally, I think this argument holds a little water in that corporate debt can be said to be illiquid as well. It's not necessarily widely held as government bonds, for example. And without the express intention to hold ESG or green bonds, sustainability-themed bonds, um, looking at those criteria for holding them, we can keep looking for reasons to not hold these bonds. Um, you know, if the return stream is compelling enough, then, you know, I don't see why illiquidity should be a barrier to entry within within a market for pension funds where the liabilities are, in fact, longer dated and we, we want to hold these assets uh, in order to achieve the outcomes that we set society. Looking at corporate issuances, I think the biggest thing I'd like to point out here is that corporate engagement needs to begin in earnest. You know, whilst companies are aware that sustainability is a theme in the market and, you know, they need to address it, I'm not quite sure that they've taken the concept of ESG risks um, by the horns, if you could call it that. And, you know, that discussion needs to happen. The intent to address risks rather than be reactive to them. You know, taking uh, the corporate sustainability report where these, these opportunities or these risks are, uh, or impact is often reported, it needs to move out of that conversation into an assessment of financial risk for these businesses. And for that, you want these companies within the JSC or uh, for that matter, the private markets aspect to, to consider the just transition of energy. Um, and, you know, I think the, the, the use of funding for, uh, for this would be better suited once they, they are fully aware of their own corporate strategies. Moving on to government issuances. I think the state energy transition is, 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 a, is a pressing topic for, for South Africa. And in fact, this presents quite an elegant solution for, for green bonds. You know, inciting this illiquidity and, and the points that I've just raised above there, I think if government were to issue this debt, de-risking it through national treasury guarantees, uh, stronger governance and transparency, in fact, these bonds would then be included in the bond indices, bringing more liquidity to market, the government being a market maker in this sense. There have been some sovereign, sovereign debt, uh, green bond issuances, 16, uh, 16 countries for that matter, but I don't see why um, you know, South Africa with, with this prime problem can't play a role in, in this particular area. And, you know, it, it really does uh, bode well for, for green and sustainability themed bonds that are uh, part of the Paris, Paris Accord requirements for ourselves as, as South Africa, as well as the fact that the social aspects of the environmental issues are, are joined and, um, I think the government could make long strides in, in getting us in, into a better space to invest in them. Moving on to regulation, there's, there's quite, there's quite thin, thinly regulated um, definition around what taxonomy means, as well as the reporting requirements around sustainable investments, uh, things such as vote outcomes, you know, all of the points that I've mentioned above, we don't quite have a coherent method outside of Regulation 28 suggesting that uh, funds incorporate ESG into their thinking. But, you know, in terms of that reporting aspects, the ability to make decisions thereof, the pipeline for investments, uh, taxonomy so that, uh, you know, as we attract foreign direct investment, that there's, there's a measurement aspect of this as well. You know, if, we, if we're going to be serious about addressing the, the social and environmental risks of the climate emergency, then we ought to break this data bottleneck and the silence on, on climate energy financing. Supply and demand of green bond issuance will then begin to grow locally. Pension fund trustees, so just in conclusion, I think pension fund trustees have to balance the fiduciary role uh, as well as considering the viable investment opportunities that, that the asset managers themselves have in front of them. These investment prices are required to match the liabilities that the pension fund has 
and, and is trying to, to settle in, in the long term. And those include the likes of climate and social stability. We might not agree on all things considered, but increasing the where both sides intersect is a great start. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pranav. Uh, that was extremely useful. Uh, and again, I think what, what we're struggling with here is we actually had an enormous amount of uh, ideas now and, and insights into what is happening in the market and the, and the big opportunity ahead of us. Uh, so great start in terms of the information that we're receiving from our panelists. And I hope this will be uh, kind of fertile inputs to uh, future discussions. So with that, I want to hand over to uh, Homozo Romokala, uh, who is Principal Officer at the Telcom Retirement Fund. Uh, Homozo, if you can uh, turn on your video and unmute yourself if you haven't already done so. Uh, Homozo commenced his career at Alexander Forbes Financial Services uh, in employee uh, benefits as an employee benefits consultant. And uh, in 2011, he joined Anglo-American Platinum as the Principal Executive Officer of the Amplex Group Provident Fund. And he is now currently uh, um, Principal Executive Officer at the TRF. So, uh, Komoto, over to you. The, the panelists and the presentations earlier on have made it clear that there is a big disconnect between um, green energy, sustainable finance, and what trustee boards are provided with for the tools that we have um, available to us. The, the theme is, is common and consistent. I'm not going to repeat what the earlier speakers have said, but there's a huge um, need for asset managers to be upskilled um, to respond to the need of green finance and sustainable investing. I mean, it's a no brainer. We cannot ignore it. Um, trustee boards also need a lot of um, upskilling. Um, the survey was intense in, in, in completing it. Um, you, you had to think a little bit outside the broader surveys that we take because um, we don't normally allocate time to such surveys. So I found the survey very intrusive um, in that we uh, had to apply our minds with uh, advisors as to how do we accurately respond to um, the survey. So I think that there is a, an appetite for green finance because without a, a better world, um, we cannot have returns that need to sustain us going forward. So I think, with that said, we we you know we are we are we are, we are aligned and, and it, it, it's reflected in the surveys or in the the presentation that uh, Grant was doing earlier on. There is a, a a need, there is an appetite to move on to well to to allocate a bit more to green finance. Um, let's see the projects. Let's have the upskill as mentioned earlier to you. Um, it's almost a whole new asset class or um, discussion that needs to happen in South Africa for this process to move forward. Fantastic. Thank you. So I have the pleasure of introducing our last panelist, Kobus Harnakom, who is the convener of the Batseta Commercial Fund Forum. Uh, he's also the principal officer of the Sunlam Umbrella Fund. So Kobus, I think if you can bring us into the finishing line, uh, what do you see as the work that now needs to be done to make it possible for more funds to engage in green and climate finance? Well, Louise, to pick up on uh, what um, Ulana was saying, nobody wants to retire in the wasteland. And I also want to pick up on his note that this is your moment as an industry. Our, our moment as the industry from a commercial fund perspective is to make sure that we remove the structural difficulties we have to align what retirement funds are required to do uh, with uh, those activities that we believe the asset manager should be doing. And so that really is the crux of the matter. When, when you have member choice in a retirement fund, you don't have segregated portfolios that the trustees have total control over. You have pool portfolios that are managed and run by, by popular asset managers. And as a result, the trustees don't have direct control over those mandates. And the only way to change them is for retirement funds as a group to talk to asset managers as a group uh, to agree on a taxonomy, to agree on a reporting timeline, to agree on priorities, almost a form of impact. Uh, what is it that we'd like to see first? And that, I believe, is the right way to go forward. I'm delighted with, uh, with where we are from the point of view of the research that's been done. We've identified the right things, and on this basis, I believe we will be able to make the best progress. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much to all the panelists and uh, thank you for participants who stayed on the line. Uh, we've still got a, a number of you with us. We've scratched the surface with these uh, survey findings. There's a lot more in the report. I encourage you to have a look. And I encourage the uh, FSEA and IFC to continue the work uh, supporting this dialogue. I think there are other partners as well. But CETA recently launched the update, updated RIO guide, the guide to responsible investment and ownership, which provides a lot of the capacity building and guidance that many of the funds are asking for. So there are many other partner organizations that are working actively to support the pension fund industry. We hope that this survey results provide you with data and insights to help you design future programs. And we really look forward to, and we also have a note from uh, National Treasury has been on the line, the team that is leading the work on the green finance taxonomy that National Treasury is developing and will be launched next year. So uh, in a beta version. So it might be that some of the funds or the asset managers on the line here would be interested in that taxonomy and helping to test that taxonomy, which the intention of is to create uh, less friction, less cost in the system and more alignment in terms of what is tracked and what is reported so that pension funds and retirement funds can move into more of a strategic position of uh, designing their engagement with green climate finance and the sustainable development goals. So with that, I want to thank the FSCA, FSCA again for their collaboration. Uh, thanks to all the participants and the panelists for your contributions. This webinar recording will be made available to everyone who registered, uh, and we really look forward to engaging further with you in the future. Thank you very much.